This is a production of Cornell University. Great introduction to my talk, but I'm going to hound it in a little further. So let's start, ta start by talking about the soil carbon cycle and how it is so important to the global carbon cycle. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the soil carbon cycle starts in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Plants photosynthesize and fix that carbon into their own biomass. It becomes organic carbon. And then it ends up inevitably in the soil in one form or another. And from there, it be can become stabilized in the soil for long periods of time, or it can be emitted back out into the atmosphere, usually in the form of carbon dioxide. And this diagram that I'm showing here doesn't do it proper justice, but if you look at this bottom number in the corner there, that's 2,300 gigatons of carbon in our soil. That is three times more than what's in the atmosphere and four times more than what's in every living body on the earth. This is a huge reservoir of carbon. And as such, there's huge fluxes of carbon going into soil and leaving soil. So what we're really concerned about in terms of climate change is that because of those huge fluxes, there's huge potential for feedbacks in this cycle to climate change. Is the cycle gonna make our climate change situation worse or maybe it'll mitigate it? That's an open question. And the key to understanding the cycle and understanding these fluxes and how they might change in the future is the microbes. So microbes are key. They decompose the organic matter that ends up in the soil and their metabol metabolism mineralizes it into forms that make it back into the atmosphere. So the key, the key issue here is we're trying to model carbon and predict it in the future. So let's talk a bit about that. This graph here is showing um, the change in total carbon stocks, uh, either increasing or decreasing in the negatives. And it predicts that out using three models to the year 2100. And we're looking at three different models here. And each model makes different assumptions about how the microbial community works and how it processes the carbon that it comes into contact with. One model is showing that we're gonna be building carbon stock over time, which sounds great. Another is showing that there's gonna be negligible changes in our carbon stock over time. And last is showing catastrophic losses in soil carbon. And this is a huge amount of variability to have when we're trying to predict something as important as cli the climate. So there's huge uncertainty in these models and the real source of that uncertainty is the microorganisms. We need to study these things so we, that we can parameterize them in our models in a way that helps us predict what's going to happen in the future. Let's look into more detail about how these microorganisms are processing the carbon we see in our soil. So this is something we call the microbial carbon pump, and it's kind of the working model that microbial ecologists are using for microorganisms in the carbon cycle. We start with organic matter shown here as a dead decomposing leaf. And the carbon in that leaf is gonna be metabolized by the living microbial biomass that exists in the soil. Some of that carbon is going towards making more microbes, more cells, and some of that is being lost via mineralization as carbon dioxide. From there, that living microbial biomass is producing metabolic byproducts, and it's also dying and becoming necromass. And the key thing about these two pools is that they're very sticky. They tend to become stabilized in soil via two mechanisms. One is called entombment, where that sticky stuff can kind of get surrounded by soil particles within an aggregate and be separated from living biomass that might otherwise eat it, and then it's stabilized. And another major mechanism is via adsorption. So this sticky uh, microbial carbon uh, can stick to the outside of the soil matrix, usually via mineral interactions, and that makes it inaccessible as well. So in this way, microbes are driving carbon losses, but they're also driving carbon stabilization. So it's really about the balance of these things that matters. So we really want to know what parameters are dictating wh what pool carbon is gonna end up in and under what conditions. And if you think about it, at it's very like at the very fundamental uh, 
at the very fundamentals, uh, clicking problems, growth and death are dictating where the carbon is moving in these pools. So that's why I focused on this for my PhD work. So I'm going to give you an example of how a growth uh, metric can inform carbon metabolism and possibly carbon cycling in soils. And to do that, we're going to talk about something called carbon use efficiency. So this graph is showing um, on the y-axis maximum growth rate. And on the x axis, that carbon use efficiency, which is the proportion of carbon use that ends up as biomass. And what this landmark paper found is that generally, the faster a microorganism grows, the less efficient it grows, which means less of the carbon it eats ends up as more cells, and more of it usually ends up as carbon dioxide and other byproducts. So I'm going to make an analogy here that I hope makes sense. We're going to pretend the microorganisms are cars and that a fast microorganism is like a sports car. That sports car can accelerate very quickly and get from point A to point B very fast, but it's not being very fuel efficient while it does that. Whereas um, a slower growing hybrid car microbe is not going to get from point A to point B quite as quickly, but it's going to be much more fuel efficient as it's doing that. So if we abstract this analogy out to a microbial community, you can see how maybe the community composition of a microbial community might matter in terms of where carbon ends up. If we have a community filled with hybrid sports car bacteria, we might have uh, more carbon ending up stabilized in the soil and vice versa, but that remains to be proven. So moving on, I wanted to go over how we do, um, research and measure microbial communities and soil for those of you who aren't familiar. So the gist of it is that we take soil from the plot or whatever um, area of interest, you extract all the DNA in that soil, and then we target a specific marker gene that is unique to each species that occurs in the soil. And this particular gene is called a 16S B4 region of the ribosomal RNA gene. Um, you don't need to remember that word, but that's what we use. So then when we, uh, we sequence that particular marker, we can assess the diversity in the soil. So we have a microbial community. Each species in that microbial community has a unique sequence associated with it. And when we sequence those markers, we can kind of count them up and see, okay, we have this many species here, and they're in these abundances in the soil. And this is great, but it's actually not good enough for estimating growth and death. And there are two big reasons why. The first is this data is compositional. The second is how do we even estimate something like growth and death in really complex data? So let's talk a little bit more about those two things. So sequence data is fundamentally compositional, which not a lot of people know, but it is true. And I have uh some graphs here that are showing this how this can affect things um badly so on the your left hand side we have two species they're both growing at different rates and i've shown that data in two different ways when we sequence it all it becomes compositional and that be, um, creates strange artifacts and it skews the abun the perceived abundances of these species in the samples so you can see that now growth looks warped and it can even look like death in some cases. This is the same data, but it's compositional. And I can't, it would be really problematic to try to estimate growth and death from data like this. Fortunately, there is a fairly simple solution and that is to use internal standards in your sequencing effort. So here we have um, an example of species A and species B again. One is growing, the other remains um, uh, the same abundance throughout two time points. And to these uh, samples, we're going to add the same amount of an internal standard, a uh, known DNA sequence that we can track throughout the sequencing process. So when we sequence, uh, things become wonky, including the internal standard. Its uh, counts have been biased to reflect that compositionality, but those numbers still reflect the same amount of DNA. So we can use that to correct the abundances of our own known, unknown species. And I 
did that, you do that by basically just dividing the internal standard counts by each species counts, and you get something called a normalized abundance. And at the end of that, you get something that looks like this. So the actual abundances aren't the same as what they would be in the environment, but the relationships between those abundances are corrected. And that's what is really important if I'm interested in growth and death dynamics. So great. We can bypass this compositionality issue. So now I have a way to get the data I need. But next problem is how do we estimate growth and death? So this graph is an example of one species from one of my experiments. And we have the log normalized abundance on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. At first glance at this, you're like, Cassie, of course that's growing. Look at it. But that's not very scientific. Um, we need a way to objectively say that growth or death did occur. We need a way to say when that period of growth or death happened, because it's pretty obvious looking at this that the species didn't grow throughout the entire period, right? And then we also need to be able to do that like hundreds of, and th maybe thousands of times because of how much data we have. So to tackle that problem, I created this algorithm that I'm calling an elongating sliding window. And this algorithm detects all potential periods of growth and death, and then chooses the one best one. So I'm gonna show you how this works using an idealized example that I made up. So again, we have normalized abundance on the y-axis and day on the x-axis. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a linear regression and fit it to every single possible time window in this data. And we're gonna ask the question, is the slope of that regression significantly different from zero? If it's greater than zero, that indicates growth. If it's less than zero, that indicates death. So let's run through this. First, the algorithm picks the minimal set of time points from the beginning and fits a linear regression, elongates it, checks again, elongates, checks again, moves over, checks again, elongates, etc. So in this way, it's going to check every single possibility and record um, what seems to possibly be growth or death. And at the end, in this example, we end up with two possibilities for growth. And I decided to pick the best one based on the one with the lowest residuals or errors surrounding that regression. So we end up with something that looks like this. And I just did a lot of regressions. So to control for false positives, I randomly generated data and applied the same algorithm to it to assess just how many spurious uh, growth or death estimates would I get in data that obviously isn't reflecting growth and controlled for that. All right, so here's our example again. This is what my algorithm decided was probably the best guess for when this was growing. And from this one regression, we can actually get quite a bit of information. For instance, when start, the start and end of growth were, we can get the growth rate based on the slope of this regression. We can also get a indication of the net growth of that organism. So the difference in the abundance at the end of the time period versus the beginning. And it's important to note that this isn't just growth, it's growth minus death, because death can be happening simultaneously as growth. It's just when growth exceeds death, is when it appears to be growing. All right, so let's actually get into my experiments now. My main hypothesis for all this work was that variation in microbial growth dynamics will drives variation in soil carbon cycling. So in my first chapter, I looked at how different soils with differing carbon fate might differ in their bacterial growth dynamics. In the second chapter, I looked specifically at how these growth metrics shift over the course of decomposition of plant litter. And in my third chapter, I was trying to combine lessons learned from the first two and assess this, um, what bacterial growth strategies might be existing in soils and what that means for carbon cycling in those soils. And at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about how growth and death are linked. Okay, on to the first chapter. So here, my prediction is that soils with differing carbon fates are gonna reflect that with differences in their microbial growth metrics that I can measure. And to test that, I had an experimental design that used soil microcosms. I went out into a field, grabbed soil, and put it in a bottle. And, oh, oops, 
that. Uh, slideshow from current slide. Perfect, no problem. Okay, so I took soil from an agricultural plot, which has more disturbance and there and tends to have less carbon stored, and also a successional plot that hadn't seen agricultural and agriculture in a really long time and was less disturbed and had more carbon stored in its soil as a result. To the soil, I added water and or some like a cocktail of carbon compounds for the microbes to enjoy to, and eat. And this was a, a combination of soluble and insoluble insolu carbon compounds that are commonly found in plant litter, so common constituents. <laughs> I incubated these for 50 days and I took samples and triplicate destructively over time. And from there, I did sequencing and my growth estimations. So these are four examples of species that I found in these soils, um, just to kind of showcase the diversity that we're looking at here. The, uh, again, normalized abundance on the Y axis, time on the day axis. Um, and the dashed line is showing my growth estimate from the algorithm. The inset numbers there um, are showing you G, which stands for generation time. And that is the number of days that the population needs to double in size. So a lower generation time means faster growth. Lag is how long, how many days it took for that population to start growing. And then net growth is showing just the difference in abundance at the beginning and end. So that's what four of my, my examples look like. But overall, I got 453 species estimates in this way. The average generation time was five days, but it ranged from less than a day to over 60 days. The lag time was on average one and a half days, but ranged from zero to all the way to 21 days. And then the net growth varied by four orders of magnitude. So we're looking at a broad range of diversity here within these communities in terms of their growth strategies. And then I looked at these growth metrics in two different ways, um, kind of a broad level resolution and a really fine resolution. So I have three replicates. And one way to look at this is to take my growth metric like growth rate and just average it for every single growing member in that sample, which I called a community level metric. The other way to do it, oh, and you do that for every replicate, obviously. The other way to do it is to look at it, uh, this information species by species. So instead averaging across replicates for an individual species and doing that for each species that grew. So let's look at the community level data. So this graph is showing the crop and successional soils and the closed circles are where uh, samples where I added water plus carbon to eat and the open circles are just water. So this lag time, so how long it took these organisms to start growing, uh, was significantly affected by both land use and carbon addition. So it took microbes longer to start growing if they were from the successional soil, and also if they didn't get carbon uh, added to them, which kind of makes sense. I also looked at net growth, so how much they grew. And uh, unsurprisingly, when you add carbon to uh, microbial community and give them more food, they grow more. So that's encouraging to see, but I didn't see any effect of land use on this metric. But then when we looked at growth rate, it, the data is all over the place and I don't see any effects and that's confusing, but I didn't give up here. I decided to look at species level, what this data looks like. And so to explain this graph on the x-axis, we have the growth rates. And on the y-axis, we have something called kernel density, which is a fancy way of showing frequency. So if something has a higher peak, it means there's more individuals growing at that growth rate than something with a lower peak. All right. And then this data is showing the water treatment. And what you can see, first see here is that these are not normal distributions. And these distributions look and are different from one another between soils. And also something that stuck out to us was that there seems to be two subpopulations within these distributions a slower group and a faster group. Group. When we look at the carbon added uh, data, these distributions seem to shift and look more similar to one another, but it does seem like there's still different groups within the whole community. So to look at this um, in more uh, 
specifically, I use something called Gaussian mixture modeling, which is a way to um, test if uh, distribution is best fit by multiple normal distributions. And I found that in most of my treatments shown here that the distributions were best described by two normal um, distributions rather than just one with the cropped water added being the odd one out. But using these clusters, I could then um, say, see that the slower group tended to shift upward in growth rate when carbon was added, but the faster group didn't. So this is interesting. We have shown that different groups of bacteria can respond differently in their growth metrics when we give them food. Additionally, we wouldn't have known that if we just looked at the community in aggregate. It's, this shows the value of looking at individuals within a community instead of just looking at the broad stroke. But that's all well and good. What does that mean for carbon cycling, you ask? Well, let me tell you. All right, so we're on to chapter two, and here I'm looking at how these growth metrics are changing over the decomposition process. So my prediction is that growth traits will vary during decomposition, reflecting different stages of decomposition. And I have a similar experimental design, but one key difference is that I use sand microcosms that I inoculated a soil microbial community onto and fed um, some grass material. And the reason I did this was because I wanted to remove the influence of soil carbon and other confounding factors. So I could just focus on the decomposition. I incubated these, took growth estimates, and took also CO2 measurements so I can get an idea of what the carbon flux was like throughout this process. Okay, so one thing I noticed when looking at this data is that the entire community, so we're looking at the total abundances of the communities I tested over time, they go through very distinct phases. So there's something called an exponential phase where growth is exceeding death. And then the communities transition into what's called a stationary phase where growth is equivalent to death. And what's interesting about this is that CO2 emissions from these communities tend to be increasing during this phase and decreasing during this phase, at least in the experiment, this experiment that I ran. So I wondered, is there a difference between microorganisms that only grew during this early phase versus ones that continued growing throughout? which I called early and continuous respectively. So here's two examples of those. So these are individual species. And you can see that um, this early example abruptly can't continue growth as it was when it hits that um, community plateau, whereas this other species just kept on going. So I, I looked at the growth metrics for these two groups. Um, and I found that growth rates and net growth were different for these groups. So the early growers tended to have higher growth rates than the continuous growers. But despite that, the early growers didn't grow as much as the continuous growers. And so I wanted to know how do these different strategies relate to carbon cycling in these microcosms? To do that, I uh, calculated something that I'm calling a net growth efficiency, which is the sum of all of the microorganisms that grew the change in their abundance during a certain time period divided by the amount of mineralized carbon dioxide. So what this means is that if a community grew very little in a time frame but emitted a lot of carbon dioxide, we'd consider that lower efficiency. Whereas if a community grew very little but also emitted very little carbon dioxide, we'd consider that higher efficiency because less we're losing less carbon for the same amount of growth. All right. So this is what that data looks like over time. We see an increase in the growth efficiencies and then a plateau mm -hmm. at around day 12. And then this is where um, that shift from early to continuous growth started to happen. So it seems like there might be a relationship between these growth traits and what's happening to the carbon. And what I found was that um, when I looked at the weighted mean growth rates of a community, so based on the abundance of the species, um, and compare that to the respiration rate of a community at a given point in time, there was a strong positive correlation. So the respiration, if a community has on average greater growth or faster growth, I should say, it tended to be respiring more carbon. 
So the takeaway here is that they're this is pointing towards a relationship between the growth strategies that exist in the community and the carbon, carbon cycling that's happening within that community. But what about natural soils? <coughs> Remember, I took sand, put litter, plant litter in it, and then inoculated com a community on top of that. Let's look at this stuff in an actual soil, which is what chapter three is about. So my prediction here is that differences uh, for in soils that have different carbon, carbon fate, there will be differences in the growth strategies represented. So I have a very similar experimental design. I'm back to using actual soil in my microcosms. And I looked at an agriculture, agric agricultural versus a meadow soil, which have low and high carbon storage, respectively. And on top of this information, uh, oh, and I added bent root as their food source. On top of this information, I added some data that a previous grad student had collected from these same soils. So he looked at what these species tended to like to eat in terms of their carbon sources. And so this gives me an idea of what their carbon metabolism might be like. I'm gonna use those to assess what life history strategies exist within these communities. Because there's, I'm expecting there to be combinations of these traits or metrics. Let's take a detour and talk about life history strategies. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, this is very well studied in plants. And it turns out that this uh, theory that I'm gonna talk about is actually pretty useful for bacteria. So bear with me. This is called the CSR triangle theory. It was made up by Grime in the 1970s and it's actually um, pretty useful for plants. So we have plants that are considered competitors like a tree and they tend to have moderate growth rates and they have a lot of traits for resource acquisition, like making a lot of uh, limbs that can capture as many, uh, as much sunlight as possible. We have stress tolerators like a cactus and those tend to have really slow growth rates and a lot of traits for survival. We have ruderals, which are weeds. These have fast growth rates and a lot of traits geared towards rapid reproduction. And all of these traits are a result of the environments that these species grew up in. So a tree became a tree because it was an environment where competition was a big selective force. A weed became a weed because it evolved in areas with a lot of disturbances like wildfires. The faster you're able to reestablish, the better off you're gonna be. And then a, you know, a cactus is a cactus because it's in the desert, there's not a lot of resources available and there's a lot of stress to deal with. So all of these traits trade off to create an optimum life history strategy for where it is in the world. And as it turns out, this is actually pretty useful for understanding life history strategies in bacteria. That grad student that I uh, talked about earlier looked at various uh, carbon metabolism traits, et cetera, and found that they map pretty well to this framework. So this competitor and uh, ruderal and stress tolerator uh, lifestyle. I'm not gonna go into detail here, but um, yeah, it looks vaguely triangular and the traits make sense. So my question is, will this hold up with the growth metrics that I'm measuring? So what I did was I took these features, I took um, growth rates, lag times, um, growth length and net growth as my, the features I measured. And then I incorporated uh, carbon, carbon metabolism features, like is that species able to use xylose or cellulose? And I fed this into an algorithm called Camilla, which is an implementation of the k-means algorithm that can handle mixed type data, which is what this is. So I went from this blob of data to something that I could start parsing out and looking at uh, groupings of traits or metrics within. So let's look at those. It, to my surprise, it actually works out. So in this uh, purple cluster that I found, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of information that pointed towards a competitor life, like lifestyle. And for the other clusters, it worked out as well. I've changed stress tolerator to scarcity adapted because when we're thinking about bacteria in terms of the carbon metabolism, the stress that we're thinking about is actually lack of resources. But to sum up the differences between the strategies in these different clouds of data, we've got um, ruderals with really high growth rates and competitors and scarcity adapted bacteria with lower, slower growth rates. 
We've got net growth being very high for the ruderals and competitors. So when they grew, they grew a lot and growth being very low for these scarcity adapted ones. And then spanning kind of up and down, uh, we have a substrate use profile. So these competitor type bacteria tended to use a great diversity of different substrates and didn't really have a preference for any single one. Whereas these scarcity adapted microbes tended to be kind of picky with what substrates they wanted to use and really preferred to use amino acids. And the ruderals kind of spanned both. It had a lot of variation in whether it was picky or, you know, ate more things and didn't prefer anything in particular. All right. First thing I asked was, how do these strategies differ between these soils? So I looked at the total abundances of each cluster in each soil. And I found that while the scarcity adapted cluster tended to be pretty equivalently represented in the agricultural and metal soils, I found that the competitor and ruderal clusters were much more elevated in the meadow soil and that the ratio of those, um, the competitor and ruderal clusters was different between those soils. So they're pretty much equivalent in agriculture, but there's much more competitive life history strategy than ruderal in the meadow. On top of that, if we look at the net growth of each individual in those clusters, in the meadow soil, the competitor and ruderal strategies tended to grow more in response to the carbon that I added in the meadow soil compared to the ag soil, but less so for the scarcity adapted. So it looks like these competitor and ruderal like strategies are particularly important to understand the differences between these soils. So the question is, can I use this information to make sense of the carbon cycling that's happening in these soils? So we're gonna go over a few facts. And the first is that these agriculture, the agricultural and the meadow soils differ in their abundances of these two groups overall. We also know that these two groups differ most in their growth rates. Competitors are slower, ruderals are faster. And we know that between the two different soils, the net growth of those cluster or those strategies differ. So, I have all this information to work with in terms of under the standard carbon cycle. And it's a lot of moving parts. I'm getting confused. And my big brain idea is just to smush it all together in one number and see if it's explanatory. <laughs> so I'm calling this a crammed parameter. I am taking name suggestions, uh, but I think it's descriptive enough. So I've taken the weighted mean. So based on the abundance of that, of a species in its community. So this is kind of capturing that community composition aspect. And the weighted mean, the, the ratio of the growth rate to the net growth, because those are the sources of variation I think matter for these two different clusters. Okay, so I calculated net growth efficiency in these soils. You see it increases, plateaus, and then decreases, but that the meadow soil overall has a higher growth efficiency than the ag soil. When I looked at my crammed parameter, um, the ag soil had a much higher level of this parameter than the meadow soil. And when I look at this and compare these in terms of net growth, like comparing the net growth efficiency to the cram parameter, there seems to be a negative correlation. And it's useful for predicting the differences in efficiency between soils, but less so over time, because each of these dots is basically a time point. Um, and you can see that kind of differs between soils, but maybe we're onto something. So the take home here is that it's not just about the growth rates in a community, but also how much growth happens and the community composition of the strategies that exist. And we're interested in finding parameters like these because we're really, uh, if we're thinking about the first half of that microbial carbon pump, we're interested in knowing how much carbon ends up in living microbial biomass versus being emitted as carbon dioxide and loss. So maybe uh, using leveraging information from life history strategies can help us find modeling parameters that help. So finally, we're gonna talk about growth and death. So yes, I, I was taking death measurements this entire time, but I withheld them until now. So I found throughout all of my experiments that there was a very strong correlation between net growth and net death. 
So that means if something grew more, it also died more. If you, you grow more, you have more to lose. Um, and you can see that this was true in uh, my communities on sand microcosms in both the ag and meadow soils. And then I also found from chapter one where I added differing amounts of carbon that this relationship was strengthened if you gave the micro microbial community more food. So this is relevant. This sounds kind of obvious, but it's relevant because if we're thinking about the back half of the microbial carbon pump, it's the necromass that matters because that's the sticky stuff that can become stabilized in the soil. So if we can predict that more death is going to happen as a result of more growth, maybe, that can help us understand how carbon stocks might change over time. So yeah, to wrap up, I'm going to do a quick summary. So from chapter one, I found that land use impacts different groups with differing growth rates differently when I add carbon. So there's uh, some nuance there when we're thinking about strategies in soil. In chapter two, where I looked at growth traits in terms of decomposition, I found that faster growth rates were associated with lower efficiencies and higher respiration. In chapter three, I found evidence for CSR-like strategies in the soils. And I found that Cs and Rs, the competitors and ruderals, were kind of the most explanatory for what was going on in terms of the community composition and carbon cycling in these soils. And finally, I found that more growth, growth led to more death. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Highly recommend putting your experiments on wheels. You briefly described your assay for death. Oh, oh, it's is yeah. it calculation or is it are you actually measuring? It's exactly out? the same as the growth one, but I'm just looking for zero slopes. So do you think you could could actually measure neck changes in necromass in the soils? So I mean it's an easy extraction. Yeah. Um are you talking about in terms of the algorithm I made or using no, the okay? Oh yeah. It, it would, you have net growth, yep, but it would be really nice to quantify depth. And then you would actually have the growth measurement if you could quantify how many cells die. Right. So I think the way I've heard of this being done is um, you using mass spectrom spectrometry to see if a carbon compound looks like it has microbial features. Right. So that's the way I would go about doing it. Um, and I'm pretty sure like we don't have that compositionality problem with that data. So more of this type of compound would respond correspond to an actual increase in death. I think one of the complications in soils is that the amount of biomass and necromass is already so high mm. that when you give it carbon, the perturbation is so slight that you need an awful lot of power to see it. So that can be com become complicated. Um, it might be easier to do in a setup where like you're removing the soil from the equation and all of its heterogeneity. Uh, maybe that's a place to start, but yeah. Thanks I was wondering questions. in the sand cultures. The sand cultures oh, yeah. have no carbon to start with. Well, you add um, plant litter, but you, <laughs> using mass spec, you should be able to tell that from what becomes necromass. So definitely. Good question. So um, I realize for people who are, who are on Zoom, uh, they might not be able to hear these questions. The question is, what is the difference between carbon use efficiency and the growth efficiency? Um, and they're not the same because I am not actually measuring carbon um, using the sequence data. I'm just looking at a change in abundance. I don't know how much carbon was used by these microbes. And I don't know how much actual carbon went into that biomass. So it's kind of a proc, it's a little bit of a proxy for carbon use efficiency, but not exactly analogous. Because in order to actually get a carbon use efficiency, measure, you need to know how much carbon was used, how much became biomass, or how much was lost. So that's the main difference. Thanks. Uh, I think, yeah, let me check that. Okay, oh, Jenny asks, um, could you speak to some of the, uh, speak about some of the barriers other researchers might face when using internal standards? How can we as a community make this easier to adopt? Good question. So I think internal standards would be great for everyone to start using, but it 
wasn't exactly super easy to implement in my experiments. Um, there's a very fine window of, I added way too much internal standard and now most of my sequences are internal standard and I didn't add enough to internal standard and now I have none to use in my experiment. So I had to do sequencing multiple times in some cases to get that uh, quantity correct. And also I couldn't really predict it either because there's so much heterogeneity heterogeneity and variability in these various, uh, like how much DNA is in the soil and how much of it is fungal versus bacterial DNA, that that becomes an issue. I think it would be really helpful for more microbial ecologists to start making more standardized procedures for this stuff. The uh, internal standard I use built on work that had been already done and verified by other scientists, but we could definitely use a lot more and I know there are, um, like, uh, is it Zymo? They um, are selling internal standards for scientists to use as well. But there's still the issue that there's a lot of nuance when it comes to making it work for your particular project. So hopefully that answers your question, Jenny. <coughs> and Kirsten, I saw you raise your hand. And if you wanted to unmute, you could ask. Hi, hi. Hello. Great. That was so interesting. Um, you have really intriguing outcomes in terms of the time frame. And, you know, I was just talking to my postdoc about this the other day in interpreting some of the isotope results. Often they're short incubations. And what you showed is like from zero to 10 days, which maybe is a time frame that many people do like incubation experiments, you find really different results than in the later time frame. So I was curious about the implications of your research for inferring from like lab to field, or even when we sample on like shorter time frames on the field, because what you're showing is there may be these like more like instantaneous or short-term responses that, that are really the fast growers and we're not capturing sort of the more holistic um, metabolism of the community. So I was just curious about your thoughts on like the broader implications of, of your findings. Yeah, so you're right that most um, growth studies right now in situ are pretty short. And that's obviously by biasing things towards those like ruderals and maybe faster growing competitors. Um, things that like don't start growing until like day 20 are gonna be completely missed. But that doesn't mean they're not important, especially when carbon cycling is something that happens over the course of years. And, you know, I only measured things for 30 days, but it just goes to show how much diversity you can even miss in that short time frame. So I think the more we can start pushing these experiments out, the more insight we're going to get into how microbial communities affect carbon cycling. But did that kind of answer your question? It did. Yeah. And I'm also thinking about like in the field, how that impacts like temporal sampling, right? Because you've also got like those in the lab, we're often controlling those carbon inputs, but in the field, there's sort of like a plant phenology that's going to influence those fast and slow growers. So yeah, I think it does. It's an interesting um, challenge for like that time part is an interesting challenge. We always talk about heterogeneity and complexity. Okay. I feel like that time part often doesn't get as much and your research really is is poignant in that in that front right so yeah I wouldn't even attempt to do this in a field because of the heterogeneity I just I probably wouldn't get any estimates but um yeah I I think right now I would only attempt this experiment under very controlled ex uh like because I showed you some nice examples of growth but there was a lot of variation as well because there's stochasticity that's going on and all kinds of other issues. So that's a definitely a very important thing to think about. But thanks for yeah. your question. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. I saw Vanessa raise her hand. Yep. So Kirsten actually prompted a question that was going through my head during your talk. And so I kind of want to just probe this a little bit. There's an old hypothesis that I think has held up for a really long time. And that's that when we're looking specifically at how substrates are, are modified by microbes into durable soil carbon. The hypothesis has been that the more rapidly decomposed substrates, so that faster flush of carbon dioxide, um, those substrates are associated with more carbon persisting in the soil longer term. 
And it's it was always a little bit counterintuitive, but it's something that's held up for a really long time. And just thinking about what you put up that was focused on the microbes and their responses, I was wondering if you can kind of comment on on what the mechanism there could be and, and how you might test it going forward. Yeah, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is death. If there's a lot of growth happening, um, and we don't measure this, but there's probably a lot of death that happens after that. And that's the stuff that tends to get stabilized, right? So. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we do something like Joe was saying and uh, measure mass spec, how much necromass is the result of a uh, fast carbon decomposition. And we see that there's like an increase that might help explain why that carbon can be more persistent in the long run. So awesome. Yeah. That, that's interesting. It's something I've always wanted to explore more deeply with, with mechanistic understanding rather than just correlations. So thanks very much. Really nice presentation. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Patsy again. <laughs>